Good afternoon, this is Megan Raymond with WCET. Thanks so much for joining us for our webcast, Learning to Adapt 2.0. The state of adaptive learning in higher education today. We have some great presenters and lots of content to get through. As we move through, please enter your questions into the question box and we'll be monitoring that and then get to hopefully all of the questions at the end of the presentations. If we don't get to all of the questions, I'll send those to our presenters, have them provide written responses, and we'll get that back out to you. If you'd like to follow along on the PowerPoint, just click on the handout pane and you should be able to download the slides. I'll send a recording out as well as a link to the PowerPoint slides next week. We typically have a pretty active Twitter feed discussion, so if you want to follow along, the hashtag is WCET webcast. Today we're going to have Nikki Bray, who's the WCET Adaptive Learning Fellow, lead us through this conversation. She'll talk a little bit about her experience with WCET, her background with adaptive learning. Then we'll pass the mic to Gates Bryant and Brian Fleming, who are both with Titan Partners, and they'll talk about adaptive learning trends and research. David Pincus and Kevin Bell will share their institutional stories. Then we'll get to Q&A and conclude. Again, as you have questions, enter them into the chat box. We'll either provide written responses if we can, or we'll hold those until the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. I'd like to go ahead and introduce Nikki Bray. Nikki has been a wonderful addition to the WCET team, and we're very fortunate to have her. Go ahead, Nikki. Okay, thank you so much. I'm very honored and happy to be here with you all today. Um, as Megan said, my name is Nikki Bray and I am um, honored to be the WCET Adaptive Learning Fellow. Uh, a little bit about my experience. I, I spent 18 years in the K-12, primarily high school setting, teaching uh, a range of science courses as well as physical education and health courses. Um, I took an instructional designer position, uh, which is what my doctorate that I'm working to complete is on. Uh, so I took a position at Ole Miss as an instructional designer, and, and now I'm a, a faculty member at the University of Memphis, and I'm my, working to complete my degree and my research is around adaptive learning. Um, my work with the fellowship here at WCT has been has absolutely catapulted my, my career with adaptive learning. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with leaders in the industry, such as the gentleman that you're going to get the opportunity to meet and listen to today. Um, and my, my major role with this fellowship is to help bring about more awareness about adaptive learning. Um, and with that, I do a couple of things. I have a Twitter um, chat every Thursday at 3 o'clock, so as soon as we finish this, We'd love for you to join me and Dr. Hassel from Western University today. Um, and we also have a couple of other things going on, so you can find out more about it by following me at Adaptive Chat at Twitter. Okay. okay. Sorry, I was just going to jump into this poll. Here, Nick okay. wanted to ask a question and get a, a sort of finger on the pulse of where our audience is at. So, if you want to take a second and answer that poll. This is great participation. Let's see if we can get to 95%, 100%. Looks like 75% of you have voted. Okay, just give it a few more seconds here. Okay. So it looks like 45% of you are just now becoming familiar with the topic, which is great. 29% of you, your institution is considering piloting some sort of content or course on adaptive, and 26% have already implemented. So that's great. Okay, Nikki, I'll let you take it away. Okay, excellent. 
So, great. Okay. So let me introduce very quickly for you, our presenters today, we have an outstanding cast of panelists. To begin with, Kevin Bell. He is the Executive Director for Online Curriculum Development and Deployment at the College of Professional Studies. Kevin leads Northeastern University's effort toward the goal of high quality professional online programs based on industry and academic standards. Gates Bryant joined Titan Partners as a partner in 2011 in the strategy consulting practice. Gates is an experienced general manager and strategy consultant with a successful track record for bridging the gap between innovative strategy and practical execution. Brian Fleming joined Titan Partners in 2015 as a principal in the strategy consulting practice. Brian has held numerous teaching, administrative, and leadership roles across all segments of the education sector. David Pincus was most recently the Chief Innovation Officer for Western Governors University and has held senior positions at various nonprofit, for profit, and ed tech companies, including several years at Google working on their higher ed initiatives. He is currently a CBE consultant helping institutions apply. CBE to their student journeys. Okay. Great. Thank you, Nikki. This is Gates Bryant with Titan Partners. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined us today. Um, I wanted to share for a few minutes about the research that we've been doing in adaptive learning. Um, we, uh, in part through uh, sponsorship from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, began an effort um, in 2012 to understand the opportunities uh, and state um, of affairs with uh, in higher education and their use of adaptive learning. Um, since that time, we've been on a journey tracking the evolution of the market. Um, and in the next month or so, we will be having a new, um, an updated version um, of our paper series, Learning to Adapt, um, coming um, to the market and available for um, free download at our website, um, titanpartners.com, um, in the library section of our website. So keep your eyes peeled for um, that research that will be coming out um, very soon. Titan Partners is an advisory firm um, focused on the education market, and Brian and I represent um, the strategy consulting part of our business. We also have an active investment banking practice. And it's our goal um, as an advisory firm to really track how the education market is evolving and adapting, uh, adopting um, innovative technologies for the purpose of improving student learning and outcomes as well as institutional efficiency. And um, over the last uh, uh, nine months, we've had a focused effort to understand where adaptive learning um, is today um, and how much has changed since uh, our initial research um, back in the 2012 um, time period. And what we've begun to realize is that the adaptive learning market has, has begun to coalesce around a definition. Um, you know, whether it's at WCT events or, or other conversations across the industry, um, there has been a lot of discussion as to what adaptive learning actually is. We, we believe that the market now is beginning to really coalesce around what uh, adaptive learning is. Um, and, you know, our version of that definition here, there are a couple of important sort of lines in the sand that we see in this definition. Um, one is uh, that adaptive learning um, takes a, a data-driven and sometimes nonlinear approach to um, providing instruction and remediation, um, adjusting to a, a learner's particular needs. The way in which adaptive learning does that is, is based on information about the learner, the way the learner interacts with um, the software uh, or the, the learning sequence, um, and demonstrated performance um, as measured by a range of assessment techniques. Um, the, the adaptive learning technology then um, allows uh, the experience to be personalized to the learner's needs um, at a specific point in time. We believe that the best adaptive learning solutions are grounded in learning science, 
Um, and as part of our work to understand where the market is going, we've endeavored to understand um, what elements of learning science are being applied. And what we've seen is a range of examples of input, inputs that uh, may influence the adaptive learning experience. Uh, and so when you're evaluating vendors, when you're thinking about um, making use of adaptive learning technologies, um, these are some of the inputs that you should be thinking about and asking vendors about their capabilities um, or interest in, um, in, in using as part of their, um, as part of their offering. Um, I'm not going to go through each one of these, but as by way of example, um, there are a number of offerings, number of adaptive learning technologies that, that take into account learner confidence and, and self-assessment um, during the learner sequence. Um, asking this information uh, uh, technology providers have found is, is a predictive variable as to whether or not mastery learning is being achieved. Um, and we see that as, a, as an important key, a key input. The other one I'll just throw out is learning style preference because in many respects it's a controversial input. Um, there are many that believe that um, learning style preferences is not an accurate um, input to the adaptive learning um, experience um, and that research that has not necessarily borne out um, its, its impact. Um, and you will continue today to see um, adaptive learning providers who offer um, an opportunity for learners to, to express an interest in the types of learning styles that they prefer. Um, while this might en enhance user experience, um, it, it's up for debate as to whether or not this particular input really drives improved um, learning outcomes. Anyway, the rest of them I think are relatively self-explanatory, but these are some of the inputs that we see as being critical um, in the consideration set as, um, as these tools adapt to a learner's um, experience. So that's the definition around adaptive learning. As we've tracked the market, um, we have come to a point of view around where we are. Um, and based on conversations with um, a 20 or so institutions, um, gathering um, requests for information, information from um, 30 or more vendors in the adaptive learning space um, and interviewing and receiving uh, demonstrations of their products from um, nearly all of those, we have come to a point of view about where we are um, in adaptive learning today. And I'm just going to hit on a few of these themes and then I'm going to pass it over to Brian in a minute to drill down on a couple of them in particular. So we continue to be, I think, relatively early in the adoption phase, in the adoption cycle um, of adaptive learning. I was encouraged to see our poll today to see that 26% of you um, are using adaptive learning today. I would love to ask a follow-up poll question, which is how many of you are piloting versus how many of you are um, driving toward a, a more um, expansive rollout? But what we're seeing is that a number of institutions are innovating uh, by experimenting through a pilot. And, um, and what we found is we talked to institutions who are on the pilot path is that the transition from pilot to what's next is not an obvious one. And based on our conversations with institutions, we found that the path to broader implementation is pr uncertain primarily due to institutional factors, um, not so much factors or co concerns um, or inefficacy um, of the technology um, itself. That's the first theme, and that, that we don't see as having changed all that much. We would like to see more progress in this area, but we don't see that uh, particular theme as being a, a significant change since 2012. Applications of adaptive learning uh, technology are expanding. So we've seen the uh, offerings of the adaptive learning companies expand to meet um, a range of, of different applications. Um, I'll touch on that in, in just a moment. Um, we see the role of faculty um, changing with the emergence of adaptive teaching. And I think both Kevin um, and, and David will touch on this point. Um, we, we see that this technology is, is as much about um, personalizing the instruction um, or enabling a faculty member um, to, to, to adjust and change their, their instructional techniques and approaches as it is about personalizing 
the experience for students. This concept of adaptive teaching is, I think, um, a, a little new and different, um, but we, as we've talked to institutions, many of them have recognized that um, moving to scale with adaptive learning is as, mu is as much about um, enhancing and um, modifying the, the role of faculty um, in, under this kind of umbrella term of adaptive teaching. And the last two themes, um, again, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on in, in more detail in a few minutes. Competency-based education is relevant for adaptive, but not its only use case. Um, and we see adaptive products building out new feature sets um, to meet in response to institutional demand. These last two are ones that Brian's are going to, Brian's going to address that we've really seen the most amount of change in over the last several years. So as we think um, at the macro level around the, the various use cases that um, have begun to emerge around adaptive learning, um, you know, we would call out um, these collection of tools as ones who are beginning to gain traction or already have meaningful traction in the higher education um, uh, ecosystem uh, with, with respect to adaptive learning. And, and what you see is they really come in uh, essentially four flavors here. The, the, the authoring platform, um, the, uh, or, or an off-the-shelf, course-ready, course-complete product offering, um, delivered in a whole course format, or um, in a supplemental format. Um, we find that tools in the supplemental category are typically used in, in integration with um, you know, other course delivery uh, platforms. Um, we also find that um, they're most frequently used in, in a blended um, classroom format. Um, in contrast, the whole course product offerings um, are, are used you know, uh, in, in the online context, um, as well as blended contexts, um, but we've seen um, you know, a, a significant effort um, over the last uh, four years um, where uh, products that had originally gotten their start as authoring platforms are, are now building out um, you know, course-ready, more off-the-shelf offerings, if you will. Um, and I would just highlight um, you know, Acrobatic as, as an example there where they now um, are uh, offering, um, I think they have now um, uh, six, but on the way to a dozen different um, online um, courses that are sort of off the shelf ready for purchase. And so as we see this uh, evolution, um, we, we, we recognize that the products are being responsive to what faculty and administrators are looking for um, as it relates to uh, adaptive learning. You know, one of the biggest factors we've seen emerge um, from our research is the importance of giving faculty a sense of um, autonomy and control over the learning experience as well as transparency as to what's happening within the adaptive um, uh, uh, algorithms or within the adaptive learning um, product offerings. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll hand it off to Brian to talk um, a little bit more about um, these other key themes and trends that we're recognizing. Sure, yeah, thank you, Dave. And uh, yeah, just to continue to provide some further insights uh, from our research, uh, I wanted to touch actually on themes four and five. Uh, first, this notion of adaptive learning being relevant for competency-based education, or CBE, as well as uh, new feature sets uh, in response to institutional demand. Uh, two areas where we have seen, uh, from our research and from our point of view, uh, the greatest amount of traction and change. Um, uh, now, one of the things that drives our research, as of any good research um, endeavor, is to uncover, um, as we work with institutions particularly, um, what are the pain points that adaptive learning promises to solve? Uh, what are the issues, what are the problems uh, that institutions are facing for which adaptive learning solutions may be a way forward? Um, in a context of an institutional uh, implementation or of really anything, whether it's competency-based, a conventional program, what have you, um, again, where are the needs, the areas where adaptive learning is to be useful? Uh, now, of course, at a time when reportedly hundreds of institutions are experimenting and launching competency-based degree programs, uh, it, it's often said, and certainly as a common narrative, particularly within the vendor community, that adaptive learning uh, promises to be a powerful enabling tool for this type of offering, uh, perhaps even the enabling tool, almost like the missing ingredient that CBE programs need to flourish and to achieve uh, scale. Now, in many ways, this makes sense. Uh, adaptive learning is, after all, a form of competency-based learning, as many suggest, or is akin to it. 
Um, often these practices are seen as closely related in the minds of faculty and instructional designers, uh, vendors, and the like. Uh, near cousins, perhaps, or whatever analogy we want to use. Um, and in many respects, this is all very true. It's very rich. It's very compelling. Though it is something that we would encourage from our research um, a deeper dive into understanding these claims and into understanding uh, where adaptive learning is best suited within the universe of competency-based education, at least as that uh, practice stands today. Uh, keeping in mind that CBE is an outcomes-based design for learning, uh, in many cases it is heavily reliant on technology that can support everything from complex learning, learning analytics to predictive models, scaffolding, and learning pathways. But above all, competency-based education, uh, to be clear, is an entirely assessment-driven form of learning. Therefore, it would seem that institutions' greatest pain point in this regard is for authentic forms of assessment uh, to support learners and to drive progress through these programs. So in short, to our previous theme, while adaptive learning um, is particularly promising for CBE and is certainly catching on and, and taking root in many settings, uh, where it promises, we think, to be most incredibly effective and to have much deeper credibility is in delivering these authentic assess assessment options, simulations, portfolios, and the like, um, which are what any institution serious about CBE probably most needs. Authentic assessments that are both summative, informative in nature, personalized, immersive and engaging, practice-based, rich in analytics, the list goes on. Now what we'll see from our data, nonetheless, and this is where we have um, embraced a healthy dose of skepticism, though recognizing that uh, these issues are always up for debate and discussion, and we certainly invite that, um, is that the vendors that we captured in our study, uh, these sort of more authentic assessment features are actually less common. Uh, for instance, one in five we spoke to um, offer these, these types of features, such as portfolio cre uh, creation and contextualized simulation, which again is caused for some concern as to where and how adaptive learning is or we will be able to find its way into CBE. Is it relevant? Yes. Is it needed for assess assessments? Yes. Um, but is the current market set up to support the kinds of inst assessments that institutions most need? Um, it's still a question that we see as yet to be addressed. Now to move on um, to theme five, uh, where we do see a tremendous amount of traction is um, in areas where adaptive suppliers are building new products and feature sets uh, to meet institutional demand. Uh, feature sets that in 2012 were far less common, uh, but today are becoming almost uh, commonplace. Uh, responding in this case uh, to what's before you, and I don't think the slides are advancing, so I apologize, um, but we are um, not on this there slide. We go. There we go. Uh, responding in this case to what's before you to institutional demand for open educational resources, which we all know um, is becoming somewhat of a movement being widely adopted across various institutions and institutions, institution types. Uh, insofar as OER are used as a way to augment the availability of content and learning resources to students and faculty, to foster collaboration, uh, in many cases to drive down costs, adaptive vendors tell us that they are making use of these resources within their own platforms, opening up their platforms, encouraging faculty users and even students to develop these resources uh, for inclusion, uh, which we find is a promising indicator of efforts within the vendor community to respond to this key area of institutional demand. Um, which does, of course, uh, potentially lay the groundwork for much more expansive applications and use cases uh, to, to gauge the previous, the previous points we continue to track. Uh, so much more that we could say here. This is such an exciting space, and it's one that we're very excited to continue uh, tracking. Now, before I turn it over to David, uh, let me just remind you um, to uh, go to our website, titanpartners.com, where you can review a portfolio of our research, including our uh, previous research and, and ongoing research into adaptive learning. Um, as well as where you can sign up to receive our monthly snapshot updates and newsletters, uh, which among many things uh, will notify you um, when we publish this research um, in, in, in the coming week. Um, and we're certainly, of course, always happy to talk with you should you want to reach out um, and continue the conversation. So with that, I will turn it over to David. Thank you very much, Brian. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and happy St. Patty's Day. My name is David Pincus. I was most recently with Western Governors University. If you're not familiar with WGU, they're the largest CBE provider in the country. 
Uh, my bias is that I have definitely drank the CBE Kool-Aid. So understand that I am a strong uh, evangelist and advocate for it with the, the comments I delivered today. And I'm also not getting the slides to advance. And so I will just start and they'll catch up. So um, just re briefly about Western Governors, um, 75,000 students. We serve the 37 million Americans who have some college but no degree. And the degrees are available in business, uh, education, IT, and healthcare. But the market we're going after are those who, um, you know, again, have some college credit, but were, for whatever reason, didn't complete. So we use a lot of adaptive courses and courseware and have been exploring it for many years and talking to many vendors. And one of the biggest things to become aware of, um, half of you haven't, or are, you know, this is new to you, a quarter of you are considering it, you're going to find adaptive is probably the most abused buzzword in all of higher education today. And the vendors are not... Um, are not yet easily able to explain this simply. And it can relate to the content being different, it can relate to the assessments being adapted, or how they remediate the instruction for the students. The basic drive behind it is, um, is what is aligned with CVE, which is mastery-based instruction. So you keep going through the content until you achieve somewhere between a B plus and an A, um, you know, so you get better than 90% or something around the content you're doing it. What that means is the time between assignments and the duration of the course themselves become two very, very critical variables. Because if students get through it very quickly, they can be bored if they master it right away because you're not acknowledging what their initial knowledge is. Um, but if it takes too long, they fall behind. And so you have to consider if you're not a pure CBE institution, and you want to help students get from a C to a B or to an A, are you affording enough time? And does it map very well with a 12-week course if you're going to have a lot of frequent assignments and expectations around deliverables? Um, as Gates mentioned, it fits in very, very well with CBE because non-traditional students are the new normal. Um, it's not the only use, obviously, but it does fit in well with CBE. Um, and as I mentioned, different initial knowledge, completion rates, uh, same about mastery and time is a variable. But for the non-CV institutions, um, what, you, what you have to consider um, is that, the, uh, as I mentioned, the duration between the assignments, the uh, faculty roles change dramatically. And we'll talk about that in just a moment as well. But they have to get their head around the idea of not lecturing and coming into each student engagement with the idea of remediation and helping and having much better insight and knowledge to each student's performance and the class's understanding as a whole. That's one of the most dramatic uh, consequences of the changing faculty roles. Um, I also want to um, elaborate something that uh, Brian said before I add to it. Um, while it's promising for CBE around the authentic assessment options, one thing we have found that if it's very rich in assessment questions throughout, uh, at best or at worst, it's a, um, it's a proxy for how well they're going to do on the summative assessment uh, or any assessment at the end. Um, and at best, it's a predictor. What that means is if you have great evidence of what the student is doing through the adaptive courseware and you see an anomaly on how they perform on a grade-bearing uh, assessment or event, you have really good data about whether or not that student has cheated. And so if you're worried about that at your institution, tracking what they did throughout the courseware uh, or CDE platform through the course, you can pretty nicely correlate that to how well they're expected to do on the uh, final or midterm exams. So, uh, but this costs money. This investment is really, really, really significant. Um, you need multiple, if you're going to take the multiple content form route, you're going to investigate multiple forms. We have not experienced that OER content is the saving grace or the, the magic cure-all. Publisher content still seems at this point to be superior, and we're finding more partnerships between the adaptive platform providers and the publishers, and in some cases, uh, acquisitions. You need many, many more high-quality questions, like an extraordinary amount of high-quality questions. And then the learning graph or the knowledge graph becomes an enormous problem because as you have interrelated courses, you know, you can imagine across the sciences, 
um, the, the need to understand foundational information for chemistry or biology and physics and how that relates to other scientific disciplines or calculus um, across math and, and marketing and business and statistics. These things are all related to each other and so you have to have an understanding of if the student is struggling, how do I fill in and supplement and remediate that information? There's a, a large investment necessary for that. I believe Newton has done the most comprehensive job with just mathematics, mapping really kindergarten all the way through um, graduate school. But it's, it's a major, major investment. Machine learning is probably the only way to get this right, but it's going to need an extraordinary amount of data. Uh, it also means that you're not going to see a return on investment if you are not willing to leverage the work and the experience of others who have been before you, and you're not willing to contribute to that conversation as well. So if you're not going to have a high enrollment course, uh, or you're not going to share the course with other institutions or across faculty, then you really have to evaluate what, what benefits you're hoping to achieve from the adaptive course. Um, the variability of student initial knowledge uh, also plays into how the ROI is going to work because it's going to, um, it's going to indicate how much other remediation you need. You culturally have to be committed to the idea of improving each course through each cohort or after each cohort as they enroll, as they complete. You want to take what they learned and make the course better. And you really need to get heads around version control or anybody implementing it does. So at WGU, we actually use a version control system and software tools for tracking all of the changes to courses. If you've ever heard of JIRA, uh, that's a, uh, basically it's a software tracking school, frankly, but it, frankly, but it can use, um, it can be used for tracking any project. So all of the changes that are made to courses are tracked via annotations in the system, and then every course that's developed, the content is checked into a version control system. So if you're not familiar with distributed version control or the ideas around it or having multiple concurrent users or you don't understand what like forking a course or forking a software project is, then you should get your, your heads around that and, and contemplate how you're going to manage the multiple versions. If you're only doing things semester by semester, it's less of a concern, but if you have a rolling admission process, it's a huge, huge challenge to figure out. And slide. Please, I wish slides worked by voice control. Wouldn't that be awesome? So I will uh, talk about the next slide as it comes up. There you go. Um, outcomes, the proof is in the pudding. So at the University of Texas, uh, and this is from a different deck, there were statistically significant learning gains um, who used the, the chemistry um, uh, desire to learn and leap pre-semester course. Uh, at ASU, there was a Cogbooks implementation. If you can see the slide well, the, the improvements are pretty dramatic. So a success rate going up from 76% to 94%, that is way statistically significant, like way, way, way significant. And then um, what I think is really the most important thing is the dropout rate. So, you know, 15% to 1.5%, you've, you've cut it by an order of magnitude. That's a tremendous trend on, on students and their lives. And the fail rate was cut in half. So, you know, it, it's working. Uh, at WGU, we use a lot of the acrobatics courses, and our completion rates have gone up significantly, and the time to complete has also been improved. Um, we use products from other vendors as well, but you know, overall, um, almost exclusively, frankly, any adaptive implementation has resulted in better completion rates and faster time to complete. It does help when you're adapting or adopting a product um, to explain the students how it works and why it works, so they understand that the multiple questions they're going to be experiencing or the different paths are in fact there to help them, and the faculty need to evangelize this as well too, because it is a, a newer approach in instruction. So the scalability question is interesting, because it's, it's really less of a consequence of an adaptive implementation versus a premise going in. You, you should evaluate the adaptive product saying, I, I need to scale, or are these going to help me scale? Um, so both for, for your students and how your creators of the content are going to do that. The experiences at, at Western Governors have been if it's a self-contained courseware experience um, and externi externally hosted, excuse me, that it's been very, very performant, has scaled extremely well. It actually alleviates any burden on any internal system because we're really just providing authentication and single sign-on you over somewhere. So even at high um, periods of 
um, activity like you might have before an exam or something, it doesn't have an impact on our individual infrastructure. But you're going to have to negotiate that as well too. So, you know, in, in summary, the ROI is dramatically improved um, when bound to CVE, but even without it, you, you have to um, look at it from a reusability perspective. That's where the ROI is going to come into play. Um, mastery is the focus. Uh, time, um, if you can introduce time as a better variable um, and get the faculty buy-in, you'll also see better outcomes. And then, you know, it, you should load test these platforms. You should negotiate very, very um, diligently with your vendors to make sure they can handle the scale and volume if you're going to be using an externally hosted platform. Uh, and then, you know, the rest of your, your uh, infrastructure. And with that, I will pass it on to Kevin. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I think you can hear me. I'm not sure if I can advance this, if I can control the advanced slide. Yes, I have. Um, <clears throat> you don't need that. That's a picture of me and my horrendously long and complex title. Which we'll skip through. So what I'm going to do is just walk through some screens um, from um, some of the implementations we've been involved with. Um, I worked on a partner project with a community college over on the west coast, Shoreline Community College, um, and then we've also been implementing some adaptive tools at Northeastern. So what I thought I'd do, this is all based on the Cogbooks platform, so you'll see quite a few screens that really are, are bracketed in kind of four areas, which you can see on screen now. Um, and <clears throat> I'd like to walk you through those, and then kind of a pre-webinar question that we had was about, you know, what are faculty doing with these data? So um, I've got some comments and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, feedback uh, based on what we'd seen in some of the pilots that we've been working with. So um, I will advance again. I don't know why that's popped up. Uh, I think the screen, there you go. Um, so in terms of what the instructor can see through these various dashboards, um, as you can see here, we're looking at uh, sort of uh, completion rate module. It's really difficult to see, but the colors that you see, green means that someone has completed a section um, or a module. Pink means they've viewed it. Uh, red means it needs some sort of revision, which is uh, largely based on um, formative kind of multiple choice questioning and blue means they've not viewed. So the instructor in this dashboard can see the class as a whole at the very top that small bar shows you sort of what proportion of the class have completed the whole thing and then down below it's broken down <clears throat> to individual students within the module. You can see that one student has shot ahead and finished uh, and the others are at various degrees of completion. The next interface, we're looking here at um, assessment results and to the other colors I just mentioned, there's a brown sort of in progress uh, parameter here um, and this allows the instructor to uh, just see who's attempted the assessment element, who's completed, who hasn't viewed um, and that sort of thing uh, and they can drill down within a module for more details. This slide three, um, assessment health check report again, so the instructor can go now student by student and have a look at their completion status, scores, number of attempts. Uh, there's another color here, yellow, uh, means that they skipped the assignment or the attempt, um, which the system can be uh, set up to, to block people skipping, um, but in some cases they can uh, skip ahead and, and not attempt an assessment. Um, these are not uh, direct assessment uh, seat time agnostic classes, but it shows in this model how the students are at various stages. Uh, with our pilot over at uh, Shoreline, the community college, uh, it was a hybrid course where the students had around two weeks to engage with the content and then came back together for the face-to-face -to -face, um, synchronous live time. So a week or two ahead, but it wasn't um, that they could finish the whole course, they needed to be sort of keeping the cohort integrity to an extent. The next slide, um, this is what's called the first attempt report, so it's, it shows how many students are uh, sort of sailing through the assessments. Um, <clears throat> 
may in this case merit a revision if we're saying, I think the numbers suggest that 11 out of 12 students or something around that um, are getting straight through and if it's a multiple choice or some other form of trigger assessment you can see that you know over 90 percent the vast majority of the class are getting through first attempt um, and that might be something as an instructor that you would want to come back to and say right is the uh, are we making it challenging enough is the rigor there I'm on to the last few so this is showing um, this is somewhat in development so I'm actually not super familiar with these next three but they basically all show the sh show excuse me the same uh, ability to drill down uh, along the top you can see there are various parameters that are being used to measure um, engagement grades progress time spent this one's focusing on time spent what's nice about this dashboard is that the instructor can um, slide to see students who are spending a greater amount of could be or they're spending a less amount of time or they can say you know which students are in the sweet spot spending between you know five hours and 20 hours or whatever parameters they decide on this that can then be broken down on the next screen to get through to show individual student performance which students are meeting the criteria which aren't and then um, you know, producing the, the again the color coded. What have they accessed? What haven't they? What have they um, completed satisfactorily? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And the last slide sort of boils that down into a, a, a course level where the students are being compared against the um, the. and how much can be assimilated at a time. Um, one side of that is, is quite often the instructor, what's called expert blind spot, where he or she um, assumes that students can kind of jump ahead and go A to F or A to G or wherever, forgetting that when they themselves learned the subject, they did have to actually have to take those steps A to B to C to D, and eventually it got to F. So the data, what we saw was the student, the faculty, sorry, were revisiting uh, to reduce the initial size of, of individual pages on a Kevin, this is Megan. For some reason, unfortunately, we keep losing your audio. So this being your last slide, I'm going to go ahead and advance to the Q&A. And Nikki, I'll let you guide us through those questions and answers. Nikki, okay. do you want to start? Excellent. So the first question is for David. Could you please say more about how WGU's use of adaptive has had an impact on the faculty culture? Others, you, other users of adaptive have indicated faculty have loved the opportunity to get back to fundamentals of pedagogy and teaching. Talk about WGU's faculty experiences versus being a teacher. That's a great question, and there's a, a causality loop here as well because we hire teachers knowing that they're going to be the guide on the side and not the sage on the stage. So since, um, since the university started, the model has been, actually it's changed a couple of times, but the model for the last several years has been that you have two faculty for each student. They have a uh, permanent faculty member that guides them through their entire educational journey. And then per course, there is a course faculty, sometimes called a course mentor. And those are assigned to students. Um, but honestly, only half of the students ever have to reach out to the faculty because the students are extremely motivated, self-learners. They take the pre-assessment, they look at the results, and they just dive into the material and learn themselves. The uh, faculty, though, when they do reach out, both when they are, are communicated by the student or they reach out to the student proactively because they have data that indicates they should, um, they do take the approach of, like 
let's talk you know, very specifically about the areas that you're struggling with. They've, they've really entered the entire relationship and premise with a, uh, a personalized instruction um, approach. Now, all that being said, nature abhors a vacuum. And so when the course content, um, we call it a course of study, there were gaps in that course of study. Some of our faculty went ahead and produced lectures, um, webcasts, uh, supplemental notes. We refer to this as the shadow curriculum because it wasn't the officially sanctioned stuff. And that's something we, we frankly have to coach to because we don't, we don't want that to happen. The ideal thing is if they find a, a deficiency in the coursework, they improve the course material itself. Um, but you know, I, I think that's going to be a condition with, with many faculty. So you know, again, we hire them in with a certain premise, and I think they get addicted to the individualized student uh, instruction because um, you know, when they pass the course, many of them will call back into the instructor and help um, students who are earlier in their learning to because they're so grateful to the instructor or faculty. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, this question is for David Gates and Brian. In terms of scalability, can adaptive work in situations where every faculty member wants to build their own adaptive course? If an institution wants to make an adaptive investment, what options are most feasible, such as purchase courseware? I'll say briefly, so, my visceral response to the first question is no. It cannot work or should not work when every individual faculty wants to build their own. It's just it's a daunting, daunting investment. But then I'll I'll defer to to Titan for to either you know dispute that or or to fill in the rest. Yeah. So so David, the point is totally well taken. But I actually think the answer would be yes. Um, and and but with some per prep caveats. Um, I think what is uh, increasingly apparent is that. Um, the products are building um, capabilities for faculty to to modify um, the the curriculum and 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 course experience, whether that's sort of in in sequencing um, or in in scope. Um, we're seeing you know increasing functionality to give um, faculty some control over that. Um, in on the implementation side, you know we we've seen. Implementations um, like like what we have had at um, University of Central Florida, where um, while the, the course development process um, was 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 managed, um, faculty had significant input um, into the the curriculum um, experience and what ultimately became um, the adaptive course. Uh, and um, and and then you know once sort of initial development has occurred, um, there's a there's a revision um, cycle. Um, uh, process that's, um, that's that's managed. So you know, while while it is is challenging um, to allow for a lot of faculty customization, we've certainly seen um, a number of interesting developments along this path that suggest that um, you know institutions are are working to to put uh, institutions and vendors are working to put um, some some autonomy into the hands of faculty. Well, what about the platforms? If, if various professors are adapting courses, would it be most beneficial to the institution for them to be on the same platform, or is it okay to use different platforms across the university? Yeah, and this is where I, I, I suspect, David, you and I are probably on the same page on this front. The, 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 the more platforms you have, the, the higher degree of, of um, integration um, cost there will be and, and, and levels of inconsistency. So, you know, we we would in, encourage to the extent possible um, alignment um, around around particular platforms, um, and, and in part because the ultimate promise of using adaptive learning throughout a course of study um, is that data about the learner's experience can travel from one course to the next, um, and in time. Um, the, the potential for that is, um, is, is very powerful around the way in which uh, the learning experience can be personalized um, for the student. Excellent. Thanks so much. Uh, Kevin, thinking about interventions, uh, what do faculty do with all the data on student learning? What supports do they need to actually act upon the data 
And who is sharing ideas on interventions based on the adaptive analytics? Mm. Um, yeah, I think I think there's a couple of things. In, in the fully online versions that we've seen, the faculty are definitely using the data to go back and, and revisit the chunking and the depth of content. You know, if, they, if they've got a formative assessment where they see a lot of students struggling, they're going back. It also enables faculty to rearrange the order of, of some of the content. So elements that they requisite or they've decided need some more explanation, we've seen quite a lot of reordering. Um, in hybrid classes, one of the key things that we've seen is that the faculty have started to change the delivery of the face-to-face -face sessions. So they're using the data to see, you know, in the in the previous few days or weeks running up to the face-to-face, -face, what are the students really struggling with versus what do I, as a, a, a less data-informed and faculty member, may think that they would struggle with. So we're seeing quite a lot of that where the faculty are really using the data and saying, right, this seems to be the element people are, are struggling with. Um, the other piece is, of course, for, for faculty to be able um, if the students checked out, if the students just not engaging with the materials, it provides that at a more, much more granular level than if um, you know they're, they're in a traditional LMS and they might see a student hasn't logged on for a number of days. This will actually show you know engagement with content, that kind of thing. In terms of the support they need on that, if if it's an outreach and it's a tailoring of my face to face, then that's something I think that the instructors can can manage themselves. If it's um, substantial reordering of content, then you know they would have to have the resources to, to re-engage. It, it depends on the platform. I, I know, for example, Cogbooks is, is really working to, to enhance that, amend the content themselves. Uh, Cogbooks is a more um, prescriptive, a bit more locked down. I think they're all interested in playing with the flexibility of that, but it, it depends on which tool as to how locked down uh, the content elements are. So they may, the faculty, based on the data, need some support from either the vendor or, or possibly some internal IT. Excellent. Um, our last question, and then we're going to try to take a couple of questions from uh, the participants to uh, Gates and Brian. Uh, what's next from Titan, especially um, to tell us what do you think is coming in the near near future? Um, sh sure, Nikki. So, um, you know, Titan Partners, as I mentioned, will be publishing our um, updated um, perspectives on the adaptive learning market, um, paper we call Learning to Adapt 2.0. Um, that will be coming um, in the next month or so. Um, and we are, um, in, in addition to that work, um, in the process of um, developing a, a quality framework, courseware quality framework. Um, for youth by institutions um, as they look to um, evaluate their courseware decisions, um, both from an implementation perspective as well as from a product perspective. Um, and so we have partnered um, with, with SRI, um, with OLC, um, and with others, um, and we look forward to uh, continuing um, to work with WCT to um, roll out this um, quality framework um, tool set uh, so that institutions can um, continue to um, uh, build their capacity to make informed decisions um, around um, uh, adaptive courseware um, or digital curriculum in general. And that will be rolling out um, uh, later this summer and then in a more complete and full form um, at EDUCAUSE in October. Okay, fantastic. Thanks so much for that. Um, let's take a couple of questions, and again, like Megan said from the beginning, if we're unable to get to your question, we will send them to our panelists and then uh, send over the responses to you in an email. So Ash asks, um, how much adaptive learning includes the learners with disabilities, such as a blind learner or a learner with an another type of disability? That's a Anybody? brilliant question. And mm -hmm. we've, um, we've worked with our vendors to be sure that anything that is web-based is supporting the latest standards that make it accessible. So we're, um, we're working with the, uh, the software providers to do that. And in fact, that's one of the criteria for use of their software, that it, that it does support the accessibility standards. 
there is still a gap around text-to-speech. Um, some of the, most of the technology is pretty good in that regard, and um, many learners with uh, accessibility um, uh, features or who use the features like the text-to-speech because they can play it at a really, really fast rate. Um, but not everything has a human read element, and not everything is yet annotated. Uh, the, you know, the biggest challenge is like text in images and images that aren't tagged. So, you know, it's it's generally going really well, but there are certainly some instances where with legacy content in particular, the publisher or provider or whomever hadn't updated all the images. But there's definitely strong progress, and again, it's it's one of the criteria we require when we evaluate platforms. Excellent. Um, another question from our participants uh, is related to undergraduate level versus graduate level. So are the products focused at the undergraduate level or is there anything that targets the graduate level as well? I'll take a step. I don't think there's a targeting specifically, although what we found is that the sort of nuts and bolts pieces and particularly our community college partner felt that the second half of his course when he switched to application and sort of scenario based use of the concepts that he taught in the first half the students definitely had a better grasp and could really utilize um, the concepts better so it may be I'm not saying that's definitive but definitely we felt for sort of an entry level you know fragile learner first generation this had potential to sort of engage them with a system where they at least sort of gained the tools and some of the lingua franca so that they could feel okay I can participate we, we certainly saw that and most of the work we've done has been lower level um, but I defer if anyone else has done great or beyond okay um, I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Uh, this question is, do you know if content can be transferred from platform to platform? That was the point that um, Titan brought up before and the benefit of having a, uh, a single platform so learners' um, data and information can proceed with them from course to course. Almost all of them have editing modes but I've not yet personally seen a, a standard in the, uh, the storage format for the course content that would facilitate you know, an, an automated migration or import of the content, and I think we're probably some ways off from that. Okay. And I'll defer to anybody else on the panel who, who wants to add to that. Yeah, it, it, it's an excellent question. Um, and we're still, yeah, still early days. I think a number of the vendors um, have worked to build out um, their content ingestion capabilities, um, but making that transfer easy, I, I, I think we're 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 not we're, we're still quite a ways off from that. Great, and I think we have time for this one last question. It's a little heavy, so we may not be able to answer it fully. What are the different business models for these platforms? Do any of them follow traditional software fees, a one-time cost, or an annual cost, or an enterprise software business model? Yeah, that's, that is a good question. The answer is a little bit all of the above. Um, and so if you remember the first map that we showed that was sort of the, the whole course versus off the shelf um, and uh, platform uh, and supplemental, that sort of four quadrant chart, the, the business model and pricing schemes um, really depend on which of those four quadrants the product falls into. Um, and so the, the whole course um, off the shelf model, the, those products are typically sold um, in sort of a textbook replacement context. And so the, the pricing models typically are on a per student basis. Um, and, um, and then for products that are in the platform category where you're developing um, a content or, or um, adding content to deliver on the platform, um, it, it's structured as a, um, you know, a fee for service implementation project um, with uh, again, per, generally per student licensing for the platform itself. Um, institutions uh, are making a whole host of different decisions about 
how and where and when to um, you know uh, fund those costs um, either through student usage fees or you know through in internal um, uh, funding mechanisms. Okay, excellent. And this is Megan. I just want to say thank you, Nikki, for organizing this wonderful presentation, and thank you to our presenters, David Pincus, Gates Bryant, Kevin Bell, and lastly but not leastly, Brian Fleming from Titan Partners. Our next event is a Google Hangout on air on April 21st, and that's a conversation about connected, connected credentials that will be recorded, and we'll put that up on our website. We just announced our call for proposals for the WCET annual meeting, which this year will be in Minneapolis, October 12th through the 14th. And submit your proposal between now and May 9th. All of our webcast archives are on the WCET website. So if there's any topics that you've missed, feel free to download those or visit our YouTube. Thank you to WCET supporting members for underwriting our events and programs and to our WCET annual sponsors. Again, thank you all for participating in this webcast, and we look forward to seeing you on our next event, April 21st.